trouble, that he might know that wisdom is mightier than all else. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Today we celebrate the feast day of St. Callistus I. He's one of the saintly popes and martyrs of the church. And he has a very unique story. He was um, originally an accountant, um, a treasurer in the midst of a, a noble family, um, but he, uh, he got accused actually of um, not using the money wisely or so, and so he was put in prison, and so he became a slave. But then um, in the midst of his slavery, he ultimately um, he was able to be free, he was able to um, ultimately become a deacon, Serve faithfully as um, uh, a deacon who took care of the, the financial situation in the midst of Rome, um, and then ultimately he became pope. Um, so he was someone who was a slave, who was someone who uh, uh, experienced that whole life, and then also became pope. One of the things that was very beautiful about Saint Callistus was that he had a great love for the holy souls. Of one of those that really fostered that devotion to pray for those who have died. He was in charge of taking care of the cemetery that now is the catacombs of St. Callistus. If you ever go to Rome, there's two major ones. There's the catacombs of St. Sebastian and the catacombs of St. Callistus. Um, he was the one as a deacon that took care of, um, of that particular area. He also was someone who had a great heart for sinners, and his opponents actually accused him of being too merciful, that God isn't that merciful. And he was someone that proclaimed the message of mercy, saying that everyone, the Lord wants to, to experience conversion, to experience mercy, and no one is outside of that possibility of mercy. There were some in the church that were saying, nope, they're out, there's no hope for them. And yet he would always proclaim the importance of never giving up on anyone, knowing that God is always bigger. So he's a great saint of mercy. And probably some of that comes from just his own life circumstances of the, the experience of, of being accused of something, of being a slave, going through all of this, that it gave him a very humble heart. He, be, he was able to be a leader that truly understood the poor and the needy and the oppressed and those who were going through enslavements of different kinds, that he was someone that proclaimed the message of mercy um, because Christ came to set prisoners free. And there are many kinds of slavery within our world. Brethren, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. You were sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners. Christ, have mercy. You are seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins. Bring us to everlasting life. Let us pray. O oh God, who raised up Pope St. Callistus I to serve the Church and attend devoutly to Christ's faithful departed, strengthen us, we pray, by his witness to the faith, so that, rescued from the slavery of corruption, we may merit an incorruptible inheritance. For our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. Brothers and sisters, if you are guided by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Immorality, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, 
sorcery, hatreds, rivalry, jealousy, outbursts of fury, acts of selfishness, dissensions, factions, occasions of envy, drinking bouts, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. In contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also follow the Spirit. The Word of the Lord. Those who follow you, Lord, will have the light of life. Blessed the man who follows not the counsel of the wicked, nor walks in the way of sinners, nor sits in the company of the insolent, but delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on his law day and night. Those who follow you, Lord, will have the light of life. He is like a tree planted near running water that yields its fruit in due season and whose leaves never fade. Whatever he does prospers. Those who follow the Lord will have the light of life. Not so the wicked, not so. They are like chaff, which the wind drives away. For the Lord watches over the way of the just, but the way of the wicked vanishes. Those who follow the Lord will have the light of life. said, Woe to you Pharisees! You pay tithes of mint and rue and of every garb and herb. And you pay no attention to judgment and to love for God. These you should have done without overlooking the others. Woe to you Pharisees! You love the seat of honor in synagogues, greetings in marketplaces. Woe to you! You are like unseen graves over which people unknowingly walk. Then one of the scholars of the law said to him in reply, Teacher, by saying this, you are insulting us too. And he said, Woe also to you, scholars of the law. You impose on people burdens hard to carry, but you yourselves do not lift one finger to touch them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise so this psalm today, the first of all the psalms, it's the gateway into the world of this prayer of the church, this wisdom. And we have two ways. The way of God blessing in the way of the enemy, death. One is like a tree planted by streams of running water that yields its fruit in due season, its leaves never fade, all that it does prospers. The other is like chaff, like that 
the leftovers of a campfire. That the wind comes, we see this so much within the Midwest here, and just it just goes into smoke and it just disappears into the air. The way of the just, the way of the wicked. We see this played out in the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. Guided by the Spirit, or trying to do it on our own. That's what works of the law means here. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't follow the law, but we have to have the Spirit guiding us and leading us. We try to do it on our own steam. We fall. And what St. Paul will speak about in the letter to the Romans is that sin is so insidious that it actually takes something good and holy like the works of the law when we try to do it ourselves, it goes in and takes up a base of operations, is what he says. He actually says that there's a foothold that then becomes a stronghold. And the very thing that is good and holy, it gets turned around to become the very thing that we grow prideful of. Look at me, I can do this, I can do this, I can do it on my own not realizing that there's actually a whole bunch of poisonous venom that's just filling our heart from here. And we're up here, in a sense, doing things on our own, but the pride is blinding us to the suffocation of our heart. That's what's happening to the Pharisees. The Pharisees started to not look at the love of God. Jesus says it's very clear, saying, you pay no attention to judgment. In other words, Pay no attention to the fact that you're a sinner in need of God's mercy. You're, in a sense, looking at others and saying, look at this sinner, look at this woman of the night, look at this tax collector, this prostitute, and not realizing the very death that's within their own hearts. It says you pay no attention to judgment. And the judgment is not pointing the finger out here, but it's actually saying, wow, I'm in need of God's mercy because I'm a sinner. There is a venom that I can't get rid of on my own that's filling up my heart. You pay no attention to judgment and to love for God. That's a, that's a big indictment. You're not loving God. In your quest to accomplish the works of the law, to do things on your own steam, you're, in a sense, focusing on all the little things that you can do and start putting all of your energy there. And in doing that, it becomes a prideful thing in which you aren't loving God. You're not building a relationship with the Lord. And so you love the seat of honor in synagogues and greetings in marketplaces. Do you remember the parable of the, of the Pharisee and the tax collector? The Pharisee gets up in the middle of the marketplace and he proclaims this prayer to himself, where he says, Oh God, I thank you that I'm not like all these scum right here. I do this, I do this, I do this. I pay taxes on all my stuff. That's what's being spoken of here. And yet it was the tax collector who went home justified, which means he was made right with God. He was put back into that relationship of being part of God's family. The tax collector just kept walking in his own triumphs as the venom of the flood starts to creep into his heart, killing him. Unseen graves over which people unknowingly walk. They're actually walking over in their lives that word walk means to live, and so they're living, in a sense, over part of their heart that they think that they have control over, and yet the whole rest of their heart is dead man's bones. And they're walking over it, thinking there's nothing wrong. And what this does is, this is where the scholars of the law I mean, it's kind of funny in a certain sense where the scholars of the law are like, hey, wait a minute, you're insulting us too. And Jesus doesn't say, well, sorry, I'm sorry for doing it. He turns to them and says, well, woe to you guys too. And he says, 
You impose on people burdens hard to carry, but you yourself don't lift one finger to touch them. That's the great sadness of what happens when we fall into this pride of saying, I can do it on my own. We start looking at our own accomplishments and we start losing our relationship with the Lord. But then when we start living up here, we sort of live in a, in a fairy world. And we start thinking that we are righteous, that we are amazing, and yet we start to have different lenses for those who are in need. Those who are struggling, we start looking at them saying, this is what the Pharisees would do. At least I'm not like that person. And they say, well, you need to do this. But because of the hardness of the heart and the pride that's there, they're not willing to actually get down, get muddy with the person, and help them up. That's what the scholars of the law were being, um, were being indicted with. They were so focused on their own study that they forgot to actually talk to the God who gave them the law to begin with. They were sort of like saying, sorry, Lord, I have to study your law, and I have to focus on this because of how much I know and how much all these pathetic souls don't know. And yet the Lord is knocking at the door of their heart saying, um, going to really study the law, you need to bring me into it because I am the fulfillment of the law. Love is the fulfillment of the law, and God is love. So this is what happens when we fall into the trap of the works of the law. Do you see how this is something that just can creep into all of us, and it can, it can cloak itself as holiness, but it actually is a hardness of heart and a pride. And especially for us who are, you could say, professional Christians, any of you who are here at Daily Mass, that means that, you know, you're in a sense really wanting to, to live this relationship with the Lord. The temptation for us is not to go rob a bank, not to become an international terrorist, but it's to fall into this kind of, this kind of area of pride arrogance, of focusing on these other things, these details, but not going right to the heart of our relationship with the Lord, which starts with ultimately this beautiful phrase that Pope Francis gave right when he, he was interviewed once, and someone said, who is Jorge Bergoglio? And he gave a very beautiful phrase. He said, Jorge Bergoglio is a sinner who's loved by God. That's what we should really look at in our identity. We need to pay attention to judgment. I am a sinner. And to love for God. I have a God who loves me. A God who never ever gives up on me. A good shepherd. A father that runs to the prodigal. The good Samaritan that will heal my wounds. And yes, I am a sinner, but I don't need to stay in those chains. I can be loved by God into life eternal. That's ultimately what St. Callistus preached. When so many people were saying, you've got to cut the rest of these people off. They don't deserve mercy. He said, look to the scriptures. is the divine mercy. And he wants to give us this life in the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. But in order for us to really enter into that gift of the Spirit, it says, those who belong to Christ have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also follow the Spirit. The Spirit has been given to us, but 
he wants to reign, he wants to rule, he wants to lead us to proclaim within our very lives that Jesus Christ is Lord. And there are parts of our life, there are areas in which our desires still go out saying, Jesus, you're not Lord of this area, because I want this. This is what will really make me happy, Lord, and so I need to hold this for myself. And yet what the Lord is saying to each of us, he's the fulfillment of all desire. He's the one that can actually heal our heart by showing us what our heart has really been looking for. You know, just like I mentioned yesterday, two days ago, that beautiful insight by G.K. Chesterton. And we see this especially within the disordered, the disordered desires within us that are in terms of our sexuality because it's so apparent. It's so easy to see that. But you can use the same sort of thing for anger and pride and gluttony and different things like that that are a little more subtle. Maybe we struggle with those ones. But G.K. Chesterton said, every man who goes into a brothel is looking for God. Now, if he's looking in the wrong place, he's not going to be fulfilled there because his desires are disordered. But there's something there that's reaching out saying, I want to be loved. I want to receive love. And the only way that that person is going to be able to find it is in the arms of our Heavenly Father, loving them, giving them their identity of saying, you're my beloved son and daughter. I delight in you. I look upon you and I just smile because of the way that I've created you. The Lord wants us to rediscover that identity, which heals the desire at the root and allows us to love the way that we were made. To love not like the Pharisees and scholars of the law, but to love with his generosity and the fruits of the Spirit. Together with one voice, let us offer God our prayers and petitions. For the church, may the Holy Spirit animate each of her members with new joy and zeal for Christ's mission. Let us pray to the Lord. For those in authority, may God give them the grace of humility. Let us pray to the Lord. For those burdened by poverty, hopelessness, or sickness, may God give them peace and provide relief for their burdens. Let us pray to the Lord. For the community gathered here, may God preserve us in harmony and humility through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who have died, May they find endless love, joy, and peace in God's embrace. We especially pray for the repose of the soul of Dorothy Kramer, for whom I've been asked to offer this Mass. Let us pray to the Lord. We pray for the intention for this month from our Holy Father, that by the virtue of baptism, the laity, especially women, may participate more in areas of responsibility in the Church. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Pray for all the intentions within Our Lady's intercessory box and for all those prayers that are within your hearts. As we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Loving Father, hear our prayers, and in your grace, answer them according to your will. We ask through your Son, Christ our Lord. Amen.
creation. For through your goodness we have received the bread of the offering, the fruit of the earth, and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. spiritual drink. Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Set a fire with that flame of your love through which St. Callistus overcame every bodily torment. To Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Father most holy, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your word through whom you made all things, whom you sent as our Savior and Redeemer, incarnate by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin, fulfilling your will and gaining through a holy people who stretched out his hands as he endured his passion, so as to break the bonds of death and manifest the resurrection. And so, with the angels and all the saints, we declare your glory, as with one voice we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread, and giving thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. This is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. that you have called us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. 
humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world, and bring her to the fullness of charity. Together with Francis our Pope and Ronald our Bishop and all the clergy, remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, our spouse, with the blessed apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. O Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my room, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. loses his life for my sake, will find it in eternity, says the Lord.
the sacred mysteries of which we have partaken, O Lord, we pray, give us that determination which made your blessed martyr, St. Callistus, faithful in your service and victorious in suffering. Through Christ our Lord. Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go and announce the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks.